Good evening. We want to welcome you to our, our, I almost said Advent, to our Latin worship services. This is our fourth week uh, where we're going to be talking about places of the passion, and the place we talk about tonight is Gethsemane. We hope you've been enjoying the awesome weather, and we thank God for that, but you know what? We also thank God for you that are watching us, and we hope and pray that this service will be a blessing to each and every one of you. So on behalf of Pastor Mike, myself, and Amy, and all of us here at Emmanuel, uh, hope you are staying healthy and well, and you're having a great uh, Lenten journey with us as we look at the different places of the Passion. So tonight, our theme verse is taken from Matthew 26, verse 36, and it reads... Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us ever walk with Jesus to see the depths of his love, to behold the gift of forgiveness to gaze upon the heights of his grace, to marvel at the magnitude of his mercy, we walk with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he is betrayed by Judas and arrested by the Jews, so that scriptures might be fulfilled. Faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow where you guide. Paul writes in today's second lesson, Christ came proclaiming peace to those who are far off and those who are near. Heavenly Father, this proclamation has reached our ears, but we confess it, but we confess it has not settled into our hearts. We confess that we do not live in the light of Christ's peace, we prefer being peace fakers and peace breakers. We are more ready to worry than to trust, more ready to fret than to have faith, more ready to blame than to believe. Forgive our hard hearts and make us more alive to the depths of your love and show us what it costs to give up your son. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We take a few moments of personal reflection before we hear God's wonderful words of forgiveness. Hear the good news. Jesus walked to the places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death. For you, Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha for you. That's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. Faithfully, O Lord, faithful Lord, with me abide, for I will follow where you guide. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, because Jesus walked into the perfect storm, betrayal, arrest, assault with a sword, and then all his friends ran away, you're able to bring your perfect peace in the storms of our lives, empower us to believe it and receive it. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson for tonight is taken from our Old Testament, which is the Isaiah 53rd chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and know beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, 
a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Our epistle lesson for tonight is taken from the book of Ephesians, the second chapter. Therefore, remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. This is our epistle reading. Our gospel reading for tonight is taken from the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 26th chapter. While he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs, from the chief priest and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. This is our gospel. Calvary's mournful 
adoring at his feet. Mark that miracle of time, God's own sacrifice complete. It is finished here in crime. Learn from Jesus Christ to die. Sailors describe a storm that no one can escape, that is often call it that perfect storm. Not perfect in the sense that uh, it's an ideal thing, that it's a great thing to be happening, but perfect in the sense of everything that is combining to make it happen. Combining factors like, oh, maybe hurricane force winds, and a cold front, a rain, and a high tide. So along with those hurricane force winds, just those alone would be impossible. But you add in the cold front, the rain, the high tide, what you get is a perfect storm. You know, we don't need to be sailors to experience that perfect storm. All we need is a layoff, a recession, a child going away to college, a disease, a divorce, a parent with dementia, a relationship breakup, a college rejection letter, a C in calculus. We can usually handle one challenge, but two or three or four at a time, <laughs> it's a bomb cyclone. It's a polar vortex, a gale force winds and thunderstorm and hail included. We are in a series called The Places of the Passion. And tonight we walk with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, for Jesus, is that place of a perfect storm. Betrayal, there's an arrest, there's an assault, there's desertion, and that's all leading up to death by crucifixion. As the crowd gathers, Matthew 26, 47 tells us, while Christ was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Do you notice Matthew doesn't mention the Romans? Because that's because the Romans not, were not quite in the picture yet. Well, they will be tomorrow, the next day. That's when they'll mock Jesus, flog Jesus. That's when they will crucify Jesus. The crowd that collects here now is a crowd of Jews. The chief priest, he controls the temple. And there was also the elders who were the rulers of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Senate of the 70. This is like... Today, it would be like, well, it would be the Supreme Court and the Congress sending the FBI to arrest you. Who's leading this Jewish posse? <laughs> With so much firepower and so much muscle? Judas is. Judas, a disciple, a friend. And what is he up to? Betrayal. Every time we celebrate Holy Communion, we hear the words, O Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed. This is the night. 
This is the night in which Jesus was betrayed. Matthew 26, 48 to 50. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. That Jewish posse would not and wouldn't be able to recognize Jesus at night. That's why Judas had to give him that kiss, give him a sign, a greeting, a kiss that he gave to Jesus. That was the moment. In Matthew's gospel, the term friend, well, it also appears over in Matthew 20, 13, to describe a person in a parable who rejects grace for other people who rejects grace for other people, and they call that a friend. It also comes in Matthew twenty-two twelve, 12, to describe a person in a parable who isn't wearing a wedding garment. A friend, therefore, is a friend in name only. Hence, you have Judas. Well, as we know, the chaos continues then. It commences. Matthew 26, 51 tells us, And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. John's gospel tells us it was Peter who did that, who drew that sword. The slave's name was Malachus, that Peter, whose ear Peter had cut off. The crowd collects the Chaos starts to almost crescendo, and it seems like you have that perfect storm. Are you bouncing up and down in that perfect storm? Are you doing everything you can do right now to survive? Have you battened down the hatches, lowered the anchor, consulted the bank, Changed your diet, called an eternity, a call an attorney. Maybe you've tightened your budget. Maybe you've gone into counseling or therapy. Yet, is life, is your life right now still kind of churning? And the waves still seem to be coming in on you? Don't give don't ever give up. And why? Well, the control is clear. Whose control? You might be saying, really? Things are in control? Um, but we've got to look at who is in control. Christ is in control. It's very clear. Judas and the Jews appear to be running things, right? I mean, it seems like it's their party for that night. And let me accent, accent the word appear. Christ really is the one who is in control. Matthew 26, 52 and 53. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? We can see who's really in control here. When his enemies come, what does Christ do? He goes out and meets them, greets them. When Judas approaches, Christ doesn't run, which he could have very well done. He could have turned and ran the other way. When Peter strikes Malchus, Christ tells him, put the sword away. Jesus says in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. Here, the powers of darkness are arising against him. Full throttle. 
And yet Christ is in control. He could ask his heavenly father at any time to send down legions. And he says 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels. What does that amount to? Well, in those days, there were 6,000 Roman soldiers in what they called a legion. Do the math. 12 times 6,000 equals... Quick, get out your phone, do the calculation. No, I'll tell you what the answer is. Equals 72,000. Christ didn't need 72,000 angels because he, Jesus, is in absolute control. During World War II, psychologists started to compare ground troops with fighter pilots. They determined, really actually very fast, after 60 days of continuous combat, the anxiety on the ground of the ground troops were off the charts. After 60 days, though, an astounding 93% of the pilots, of the fighter pilots, they were happy and they were at peace. Why would that be? The fighter pilots had control. They had their hands on the throttle. The ground troops, well, on the other hand, felt forlorn. They were helpless. They could just as easily be killed standing still or be killed running around like a crazy man. What's the point? Popular wisdom tells us always seek control. We don't need a war to prove that. All we need is a backup on the interstate. You know what I mean with these highways and interstates here in the Twin Cities. Well, there was a team of German researchers recently found that traffic jams triples, (laughs) triples, <laughs> and I love this, traffic jams triples our chances of a heart attack. <laughs> Road rage mean anything to you? That makes sense because in slow traffic, we lose control. That's why popular wisdom repeatedly tells us always, always, always seek control. So what's the plan when a perfect storm hits? Always seek control. Never board a plane without a parachute. Never leave the house without a gas mask. Never step on a crack, least you break your mother's back. That's it. Face every storm by taking control. Yeah. But there's only one problem with that. There's only one problem with this popular wisdom. It doesn't work. (laughs) Would you like something that does work? When you're in that perfect storm? Rather than seeking control, relinquish control. Yeah, let me say that again. Rather than seek control, relinquish control. Give it all up. Let it go. Resign as CEO of the universe. Give your entire mess to Jesus. Look what Mark 4.41 says. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Christ is clearly in control. The calm is contagious. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so. Matthew 26, 54. All this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Christ is calm. How can he be so calm? Scriptures were fulfilled. The scriptures that predicted all these events, scriptures like like Zechariah 11:12 they weighed out as many as they they weighed out 
as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 12.10, they will look on me on whom they have pierced. Zechariah 13.7, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. In one of the Peanuts comic strips, Lucy is struggling with her Sunday school memory work. And finally she says, in her very, I don't know, very commanding way of Lucy, she says, well, maybe it's a verse from the book of re-evaluations. The book of re-evaluations. The scriptures are a book of re-evaluations. They help us to reevaluate who's really in control. Christ is in control of sin. And hear this. He forgives every last one of them. Christ is in control of our prayers. He answers them according to his loving plan. Christ is in control of our heavy burdens. He takes them all to the cross. When parents send their children to a camp, you know, we often have to sign that form called uh, a release form, asking who's the responsible party if something should happen. You know, if Johnny breaks his arm or Susie gets the measles, who's responsible? So parent signs their name. Guess what? Jesus signed his name for us. And he wrote it in his own blood. When the perfect storm hits, Jesus is the responsible party. Not us. It is his job to see us through. Christ the shepherd. We are the sheep. Christ is the bridegroom. We are the bride. Christ is the rabbi. We are the disciples. One of three things is happening in our lives right now. We are either heading for a perfect storm or we are in a perfect storm or we just went through a perfect storm. But hear this. No matter what, we don't have to become hopeless or anxious or faithless. We can stay calm. Why? Because in a perfect storm, Jesus delivers a perfect peace. Amen. Let us now go to our Heavenly Father in prayers. Tonight's prayers, I will end each petition with, Lord, in your mercy, and our response to that is, grant us your peace. We pray. Onward in Christ's footsteps treading, pilgrims here, our home above, full of faith and hope and love, let us do the Father's bidding. And so we pray. Heavenly Father, you haven't promised us a stormless life. You don't offer quick fixes or shallow solutions. But you do promise perfect peace in the midst of whatever happens. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your peace. Heavenly Father, when we're out of bootstraps to pull up, come to the end of our rope and feel like quitting, you are with us and for us. Thank you for being a father who will never forget or abandon us in, the, in our storms. Thank you for working all things together for the good of those who love you. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your peace. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you for your perfect peace, a peace perfectly suited for the moment. Our calling is not to take control, but to mine the riches of the gospel and never lose sight of your wonderful love. You are the rock that is higher than us, the rock of refuge, the rock of ages. Lord, in your mercy, grant us your peace. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Anchor us in hope, strengthen us in grace, and fortify us with a resolute courage. Jesus, let me faithful be, life eternal grant to me. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the prayer you've taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites us to walk with him to the Garden of Gethsemane, a place of great suffering, but also a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all that way to the empty tomb and to the resurrection victory. So let us ever walk with Jesus. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give to you his peace. Amen. Next week, we follow Jesus into the courtyard. So please join us again. And on behalf of all of us here, thank you very much for joining us tonight. <laughs>